Good job, boys. Amen. All right. Well, this morning, uh, we're back in the book of Matthew. We're in chapter 5. Uh, we've been going through Matthew together since chapter 1, verse 1. And so I'm sure you probably knew we're still there. But we're in Matthew 5. Uh, we're in verses 17 through 20. We're in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, last week, we... Um, the last few weeks, rather, we've seen that Jesus is talking about authority, and he's talking with authority, right? He, his message is repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, he's proclaimed authoritatively how a person comes into that kingdom. We saw that with the Beatitudes, and uh, in, as well as in chapter 4 with his ministry, and the uh, overview of his ministry. He's talked about what a person who's in the kingdom, how they look like, or how they should look, a person that's truly converted, and they're uh, truly born again, and bearing the fruit of repentance. Uh, last week, we saw him, again, proclaim with authority that you are salt, and you are light. And we did our best to uh, kind of peel back what it means to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And so this week, we see that Jesus is actually going to speak on this very issue, right? The issue of authority. He's going to, to talk about authority. And so in Matthew 5, starting in verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom excuse me, of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so as we dive into this this morning, I, I want us to think about, or I want to try to, to point out the, uh, some connections for us. And this is something we uh, talked a little bit about Wednesday night at Bible study, if you were here. And, uh, something that I uh, talk about in, in one of the classes with the apologetics students. And uh, that is the connection between the idea of law and, and religion, or the idea of law and order and theology. And that connection is that, that without one, the other starts to fall apart. Right. right? There has to be absolute truth if there's going to be law and order. And, yeah. and so today, that's kind of a strange uh, or a foreign thought. Right? We live in a culture that they want to have rules, but they don't want absolute truth. Uh, they want law and order, but they don't want anything to be certain or absolute. Uh, they don't want truth to be uh, fixed. And so we have a society that tries to have rules and law. We try to have law and order, but, but we try to do that without absolute truth, without theology, right? without, without God. And so that's kind of what we see in our society, even amongst believers, right, in churches today. There are people who want rules, they want order, they want structure, but they don't want absolute truth. And the problem is that can't possibly exist. Uh, if the truth is not said, if it's not absolute, if there's not one unchanging standard, then it doesn't work. That's why today, right, we, we have this court or that court in our society that can overturn the rulings of a previous court. But then also down the road, the ruling to overturn the ruling can be overturned <laughs> because truth's not fixed, right? It can change according to our society. It's fluid. And it doesn't work, but, but that's what people want. We, we want to treat truth like it's this relative thing, like it's not absolute. Uh, and the reality is this, it's, it's that every individual, right, for the most part, every person, to some degree or another, they want to be an authority in and of themselves. Right? It's, it's about my emotions and my feelings and my experiences. Uh, I get to determine what's true for me. Right? That, well, that may be true for you, but that's not true for me. That kind of thinking that, that is about what I feel and I've experienced. And, 
And that's the mindset largely of people today. They don't want to recognize any authority beyond themselves. Right? They're the authority. They decide what's right and wrong. It's about how they feel and their emotions. And, and even amongst believers, again, they don't want to submit to some kind of absolute authority. Right? Even those who would claim to follow Christ don't want to submit to God. Right? They don't want to, they don't want to study the Bible. They don't want to uh, pay close attention to doctrine like we saw Paul tell Timothy in 1 Timothy. They, they don't care about theology. Uh, and so they've abandoned the God or the truth. They've set that aside. They uh, put it on the back burner or watered it down. And, and so then you have, trying, you, have, you have people, not just in society, but church, that are trying to uphold some standard for truth, right? They want to uphold some standard for behavior or some standard for uh, the right way to think, but they don't have a, a standard for truth. They, they, they don't want some authority outside of themselves, and so that creates a problem because there can't be consistent or absolute law or legislation that's built on any of the weird stuff out there today, right? That's right. It's been called different things at different times. We've seen it in, in our study of Scripture. Uh, sometimes it was dualism, like with First John and and sometimes it was legalism, uh, or sometimes it's the Judaizers, right? They want to change and fluctuate. Today it might be, you know, humanism or naturalism, or you, you may hear people talk about postmodernism or, or uh, postmodern thinking, uh, whatever they want to call it, or, or all these different critical theories, right? But the problem with all that is it's not absolute. It changes, it fluctuates. What those, what those worldviews Today, they can say one thing is wrong, but then later that thing that used to be wrong can be right, or vice versa. And so there's no unchanging standard. It's, it doesn't work. And so I want to read this to you. It's a couple statements from different Ivy League law professors uh, in recent history, not 2020s, obviously, but in recent history. One of them said this, our culture has experienced a massive loss of confidence in the law. Well, okay. You don't have to, today especially, right? This was like 34 years ago when this man wrote this. But today, you don't have to be an Ivy League law professor to see that our culture has lost confidence in law and order, right? Yeah. But here's what he went on to say. He said that culture has experienced a massive loss of confidence in law because there's also been a massive loss of confidence in religion. Another one said this, when law is separated from religion and theology, it can only be based in relativism. And that's what he's saying then, is that it, without absolute truth or theology or, 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 or without God, that the law, that order, is only based in relativism. I mean, it's based on my opinions and my emotions and my thoughts. And so today we're seeing that on a large scale, right? That if that's the way it is, if you reject absolute truth and you reject an absolute standard, right, an authority that's outside of the rest of us, which would be God, if you object that, or I mean, you, you, you deny that, then here's the, here's the deal. Uh, what does law have to be based on then? Well, it has to be based on the feelings and opinions of this individual or that individual. And if that's all it's based on, then what I don't like the law or the uh, uh, that is in place because it's just based on that person's opinion or thoughts, then it doesn't line up with my opinion and thoughts. And so why is it wrong for me to not follow that law? Because, you know, that's not what's true for me. And is that not happening right now? They just ignore and break the law. People just, just do whatever they want to do. They don't care that it's the law because it's just based on opinion according to them and their opinion is different. And so that becomes a problem. And we start wanting to reinterpret the law and the Constitution and all these other things because there's no standard for truth. And we see that very obviously today in our culture, but the reality is that the same thing is happening amongst Christians, right? We talked about that last week. And I referenced the article from The Economist uh, that Al Mohler talked about recently in his daily uh, podcast. And we're talking about salt and light and how there's all these denominations, right? First of all, that in itself. Why are there multiple denominations? Because we don't agree on the standard of truth. We all want to be our own authority to some regard. 
inside those denominations, there's divisions, right? We're seeing that denominations uh, as a group, this particular denomination will have division in it because of a authority issue, a standard of truth issue. The leadership in that denomination may have division. In local churches, right? Not just at large, but individual local churches, there's division. Because we, we're at large, right? I with a broad brush, but we as believers for the most part, all those churches we, we mentioned from that article in The Economist last week, for, for the most part, we, we don't really want to submit to an absolute standard of truth. And so we hear things like this all the time, right? People, well, I, I have. Well, Tyler, it's like you don't realize that the times have changed. And that understanding of the scripture is outdated. It's not relevant anymore. Or, well, listen, maybe that's your interpretation. But everybody has their own interpretation. And so that's just the way you interpret it. And that comes down to not wanting to submit to a standard of authority. I'm the authority, right? If I get to determine what it means, then I'm the authority. The problem with that is this. It doesn't matter what, what I want it to mean. It means what God means. Amen. It means what he meant when it was written. And, and so the issue is this then. If you and the Bible don't line up, the problem is not that the Bible's outdated or that there's an issue with the scripture. If you and the Bible don't line up, it's because there's a problem with you. Amen. There's an issue with you. But the thing today is if the word of God confronts you, just accuse it of being out of date, say it's not relevant, say, oh, well, that was, you know, at the time Paul said that, that was just a cultural thing. That's, that's not the same today. Or, or, or say, well, that's not the way I interpret that. Right? It's the idea of going and doing Bible study this way, where we all sit down and we all read a verse, and we go around the room and say, now, what does that verse mean to you? Oh, okay, what does that verse mean to you? Oh, what does it mean to you? Well, the reality is what it means to me or you could very well not be what it means at all, right? We could be wrong. It, it's God's word. It means what God intended for it to mean. And so today, that's the easy way to go, right? Is just reinterpret it, uh, uh, say it's outdated, do whatever you want to do. But that's what we see happening here. And what we're doing then is denying the authority of the scripture in some way or and I've said all these things before but uh, these words but these are important words the, the authority of the scripture right the supremacy of the scripture the inerrancy of the scripture the inspiration of the scripture the sufficiency of the scripture and but today it's easier than rather to submit to those things to, to deny it in some way and just make the Bible and what God's word says fit what I already believe Right? Make it fit my own opinions and my own interests where I'm already at. And so that's what's going on. And people say things like that all the time. Right? They'll, they'll say, uh, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but you know, it was written by men or this person or that person over time changed this. or uh, You know, there's these other books now that they didn't know about. There's, there's these other books now that we have to think about too. Right? They'll talk about the book of Enoch. And you've probably heard of that one. But there's a lot of other ones, right? There's the Gospel of Thomas. There's the gospel according to the Hebrews. I don't know if you know about those, but, but there's all these things people find all the time. And they say, oh, well, see, we must have missed something, and we need, to, we need to look at those things too and add those things in. Or people say, well, the translators, they missed this or that. Uh, well, that translation is not really the inspired word of God because there were men involved or blah, whatever, right? And so we find something we don't like or we don't want to follow. We find something we really do like, uh, and we're not sure if that's what it means, but we want to latch on to that. And we do all these things and we start to reinterpret this verse or that verse or, or do whatever to, to get rid of the things we don't like and hold on to the things we do like. And so Jesus has been talking so far through Matthew. What we've seen is that we're to be salt and light. We are salt and light. We're to live a certain way. We're to... To be a certain way and then last week we talked about we we see all these things happening in the world and we want to wonder we want to ask ourselves we talked about this last week why is that happening why is there so many that are salt without saltiness why is there so many that are lights under a basket now, but then we come to this passage and we see this idea of the authority of god's word and we can probably all nod in agreement to some degree with something i've said already this morning that it's you don't have to look very hard 
to find people who want to reinterpret or abolish parts of the law or change parts of the word of God or adjust it and make it fit them, right? You don't have to, but then we want to say, well, why is there so many that are salt without saltiness? Why are there so many that seem to be a light that's under a basket? Why is the culture this way? Why is this happening? Well, because we'll do anything and everything in order to keep from being confronted from God's word and instead try to make it fit us. And so you can't have consistency without absolute truth. You can't have law and order without absolute and objective truth. And Jesus says, verse 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. And so Jesus says, not one iota, not one dot, right? Not a jot or a tittle. None of it's going to change. And this is the view that Jesus has of God's word. That it's unchanging, that it's authoritative, that it's objective. Right? We don't get to abolish it or change it. We don't get to alter it. And, and that's what he says. Don't think that I've come to do this. Why would he say that? Because people thought that's what he'd come to do. People thought that's what he was going to do. And we see that a lot today. People still think that about Jesus, right? They'll say things like, well, the Jesus I believe in would never do that today. Or, you know, the Jesus I believe in wouldn't be like that. They think that Jesus has come to change the word of God. And Jesus says, that's not why I've come. I've not come to change or alter the word of God. But people want to do that. It's really exhausting today. How often people want to try to argue for whatever reason to make the scriptures fit their own preconceived idea or their own opinion. Make it easy for them, right? Whatever it is, you, you don't have to get on social media very much uh, to see that. You can go in a Christian group on social media and they're on there arguing about, well, that wasn't, that's not really what that means or that's not true anymore or the times have changed. And these are uh, Christians. These are people who claim to be believers. Arguing about things that have never been debated since Jesus walked the earth until recent history, right? Because they think Jesus came to do this or do that or change this or change that, but he says that's not why I've come. That's not why I've come. There has to be a solid foundation for absolute truth. And Jesus says, I've not come to abolish the law of the prophets, I've come to fulfill them. Heaven and earth shall pass away. Or until heaven and earth pass away, none of this is going to change until it's all been accomplished. So people want to say, well, Jesus wouldn't do that today, or Jesus wouldn't do that today. Or I think if Jesus was on the earth today, he would view this situation different now. No, right? That's not the way it works. Because there, there was a significant amount of time between the Old Testament and when Jesus said this that he's saying, and he didn't change, he, he didn't view it any different than what the Old Testament said. God's word is unchanging. It's the standard, and that's what he says. And so there has to be an absolute unchanging standard if we're going to have any kind of belief or standard about correct behavior or, or correct thinking or, or correct mindset. And so that's the way it has to be. That's what Jesus says. And I, I want us to think about this for just a minute, that what Jesus is talking about here is that this is the unchanging word of God. I know sometimes you we come to study this or other people come to preach this passage and they want to really get into the law aspect of things from the Old Testament. And we talked about that Wednesday night. So if you weren't here, you missed that. <laughs> right? But the, the, the emphasis he's making is about the authority of God's word. Amen. The authority of God's word. It's unchanging. And so there's no reason to argue about these things. Right? In churches today, people want to argue about how the church is supposed to be structured how the church is supposed to function, what worship is or isn't, what it's supposed to look like, how, how a church is to handle this thing or that thing. Uh, a lot of things that really shouldn't be up for major debate are because largely people want to deny the authority of Scripture, the inerrancy of Scripture, the sufficiency of the Scripture. And Jesus says it's, it's unchanging. This is the authority. Amen. He basically says to them when he says, I've not come to do away with those things. He's saying, actually, what we're going to see is that he has come to re-emphasize those things because they've messed them up. They've changed them, not him, and he's going to put them back in their proper place. 
And so what he's really saying is this. I haven't come to change what God's word says. I've come to tell you to let it say what it says. Yeah. Right? Let the book say what the book says. Yeah. And so that's what he comes to do. Don't uh, We understand that. It's the word of God that shapes us. It's the word of God that breaks us and rebuilds us and molds us more into the image of Christ. It's the word of God that is to confront us right, and, and crush us. And, and smush out, right? mash out all of our worldliness and wickedness and, and break that and crush it out of us. Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so Jesus says, I've not come to abolish the law of the prophets. I've, come to, uh, I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, but pass from the law until all is accomplished. And so Jesus is, uh, at this time, obviously talking about the Old Testament law. We don't have time to dive into all that this morning, but that leaves a couple questions that we need to think about. Right? Are we still under the Old Testament law? Because when Jesus said this, that's what they had, right, was the Old Testament. If we are, how much of it are we under? Do we have to accomplish all of those things? Uh, how important are each of those things? And these are questions that people have talked about and argued about and, and for, for years, right? Scholars just debate and, and, and have conversations over these things. But I think Jesus gives us an answer. And, and the idea will become more clear as we go through the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus is talking about the moral law of God. The moral law. We said Wednesday night in Bible study there's three folds of the law in the Old Testament. There's the moral law, which is the same for all people in all places at all times. Right? It's always wrong to murder. Doesn't matter who you are, where you live, or when you live, it's always wrong to murder. But there's also civil law, which is about the, the nation of Israel in ancient times and how they are civilized with one another and with others in order to preserve the lineage of Christ promised through Abraham. Yeah. Right? And then there's also ceremonial law, which had to do with commemorating things God had done for them and pointing forward to Christ. Many of those things included sacrifices and temple worship. But we know we talked about Wednesday. If you want to hear, I'll give you a little quick snippet. In Hebrews chapter 10, the writer of Hebrews says that the blood of sacrifices aren't sufficient, that God's not pleased with those things. So we don't have to sacrifice those things anymore. Why? Because Christ has already been the blood sacrifice once and for all. And also the temple stuff's kind of out because the temple's not even there anymore. So when Jesus says that none of it passes away, he's talking about the moral law of God. Amen. And if you have any questions about that, uh, the three folds of the law. You can talk to me later. I can give you some resources to look into. We can talk about it. But that's what Jesus says. And so uh, we talked about in chapter 3, the Pharisees and Sadducees with John. And now we're going to kind of get into it. And I'm going to move as quick as I can. But all that's important to understand the connection between theology and law and order. Between a standard for truth and a standard for living. You cannot have one without the other. And so what was the deal with the Pharisees and Sadducees, right? They were, uh, Jesus isn't like those guys, first of all. Why? They're prideful. They're hypocritical. They're always building themselves up. We see John talk to them in uh, John chapter or Matthew 3. When, when they come to John the Baptist, he calls them snakes. He says they're not repentant. They don't understand repentance. They're self-righteous. They don't believe they're sinners. How did they interpret the law? They interpreted the law however it best fit their agenda or their interests, right? Their understanding of the law, the word of God, was all about what made them look like the most righteous, made them look best, and made everybody else look bad. That's the way they talked about the law. They talked about this outside, this outward way of following the law, building themselves up, staying away from common people. But Jesus is not like those guys. He's in, out in real life with everyday people. He's going out to the sick. We've seen him going out to sinners. He's preaching to these people in Galilee that the rest of uh, the Jews would have thought of as lower class. That's who Jesus is with, right? He's nothing like those other teachers of the time. He's not like the Pharisees. He doesn't sound like them. He doesn't act like the Pharisees and the scribes. Uh, he doesn't sound like the teachers of the day. And so people started wondering, what is he doing? Has he come to overturn that and establish something else? And so he says, don't think that I've come to overturn those things. But that's what they thought. His preaching was so different from the religious elite. It was so different from those people. They thought he was just overturning what they were teaching. 
They, and what they were teaching was the law. And so he says, I haven't come to do that. Instead, I've come to let you know that they're teaching it wrongly. That's why we're going to see starting next week over and over again. He says, you have heard it said, but I say to you. Amen. He's not changing it. They've messed it up. He's putting it back where it goes. Amen. Amen. Right? He's putting it back where it goes. But the people saw that and they thought, whoa, he's going against so many things that the Pharisees and Sadducees do. That's why they got so mad at him, right? They get upset with him because they think he's doing that. They think he's ignoring the law and establishing something else, but the leaders do. But the people thought that too. And, and so that's what people think today, though. That's what a lot of people in Israel thought the Messiah would do. But he would come and get rid of the law and have some revolutionary teaching that was new and different. And that he would uh, free them from Roman rule. And he would do all these things. And Jesus says, I didn't come to get rid of all that. I, I didn't come to lower the standard. Because they thought, man, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they've set such a high standard. And we can't keep it. And Jesus says, I didn't come to lower the standard. Actually, they've lowered it. They've drug it through the mud. They've made it all about this external thing. He tells them later on uh, in, in Matthew uh, 15, chapter or verse 3, why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your traditions? He tells them they messed it up. But the people thought that he was lowering it. He says, no, y'all have knocked it off the shelf and left it in the dirt, and I'm picking it back up and putting it where it goes. Y'all made it all about this external way of following these laws and, and nitpicking these things. But I'm here to tell you it's about what's on the inside. It's about what's on the inside. That's what he's doing. He's not tearing down the Old Testament. He's, he, he's, he's reestablishing it. He's emphasizing the truth, right? The eternal truth there. Not all these outward things the Pharisees and Sadducees did to make themselves look good. But what's on the inside? What's, what about your heart? And that's the purpose of the law. Paul talks about that in Romans 3. The purpose of the law is to let us know that we're not righteous, that, that our hearts are wicked. And so Jesus gets back to the matter of the heart. That's what it's really about. But today, people do the same thing, right? People, again, they want to lower the standard. Well, I know the Bible said that, but that was then, and things are different now, so we don't have to be so strict about that anymore. Same thing. They want to lower the standard. Instead of, instead of letting the standard hold them accountable, they just want to bring the standard down where it's easy for them to meet. If we just bring it down, it's easy for me to meet. And Jesus says, that's not the point. The point is you can't meet it, and your heart is wicked, and, and, and you need some foreign alien righteousness that's not your own, right? And so that's what's going on. Jesus says, y'all messed it up with your traditions in Matthew 15, but instead, uh, he, he says, you, you, need to, you need to follow it. It needs to be kept proper. You need to have a proper view of the law. And so we've seen that going through the Sermon on the Mount so far, that the Beatitudes, how do I have those? There are attitudes that should be, right? How do, okay, this is what it looks like, Jesus says. How do I do that? He says, this is how someone who's con already converted, this is how they're to live. They're merciful, they're peacemakers. What does that look like? How do I do that? He says, you are salt, you are light. But what does that look like and how do I do that? Well, he says here, there's a standard for that. There's a rule book in place. There's, a, there's guidelines established. And it's the, the word of God. How do I do that, Jesus? How do I be, what does it mean to be salt? What does it mean to be light? How, how, how do I do that? Well, the word of God. Amen. It's unchanging. I didn't come to abolish it. It's remained the same. The standard for righteous living, the, the, the guideline, the, the, the manual for that, when we looked in 1 Timothy and Paul talks about always living a life that's godly and dignified in every way, he talks about training in righteousness. How do I do that? The Word of God. And it's an unchanging standard. Amen. And so that's what Jesus is getting to now. There's a standard for this righteousness. There's a standard for righteousness. And that standard is revealed through the Word of God. So if you want to live a godly and dignified life in every way, you want to train in righteousness like Paul tells Timothy, you want to be salt and light like you're supposed to be. You want to have these attitudes that Jesus has talked about in the Beatitudes at the beginning of this sermon. The way you don't do that is you don't do that by having a low view of Scripture. Right? You don't do that by altering or watering down the Scripture. You don't do that by sugarcoating everything. Right? We're not sugar, we're salt. You don't do that by dismissing anything that you don't like or that confronts you. You do it by recognizing the authority of God's word 
and submitting to that authority and being transformed by the word of God. But that's what the people at that time were doing and teaching, right? It was all about me, me, me. The Pharisees, it's all about them, right? Thank you, God, that I'm not like these people. Thank you that I'm so righteous. I keep these laws. Well, they're the ones that <laughs> interpreted and taught the law. And so what did they do? They just interpreted and taught it in a way they knew they could keep. They didn't worry about it if it was right or not. They could keep it. So that's what it was. It was this man-centered theology. It was all me, 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 right? How I can be this or how I can be that. And Jesus says the problem is you're, you're none of those things on your own. Amen. You're none of those things without true righteousness. And so here's what Jesus says in verse 19. Therefore, whoever relaxes uh, one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus says, listen, it's not just about right, being self-righteous or not being self-righteous. There are some serious consequences. There are some eternal consequences. When you play fast and loose with the scriptures, when you relax even the least of these, Jesus says, you'll be least in the kingdom. And when you hold to them, you'll be called great in the kingdom. And he doesn't just say teaching, right? He says whoever. He does say teach, but first he says whoever relaxes. Not just teachers and preachers, whoever. Whoever relaxes one of these things. Even the least of these commandments. Well, the least of what commandments? Well, he says, therefore. He says, therefore, whoever relaxes. And so therefore, what do you do when you see that word? you got to back up and see what the word therefore is there for, right? It's about something he already said earlier. What was he talking about before? The unchanging word of God. Amen. And so what relaxes the least of what commandments? Even the things of the word of God that we would say are, from our perspective are insignificant. Well, that's not a big deal. No, that's a minor issue. Jesus says whoever relaxes even the least of these will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And so the point here is this, right? Even the least of these commandments, they're commandments. Jesus, God's not giving suggestions. Amen. Right? They're commandments, not suggestions. Whoever relaxes the least of these. And so the point here that Jesus is making to the people is that how we view and treat and respond to the word of God is very, very important. And it's not that he's changing anything. It's that he's wanting to focus their view in the right place. The religious leaders of the time had been the ones that have changed it and lowered it and altered it. And he says, y'all are focusing on the wrong thing. I'm not changing what, what you're supposed to focus on. I'm just letting you know you ain't focused on it. That's what he's saying. And you've heard it said, but I say to you. And so the thing is, today in our world, people want to do the same thing, right? They want to relax the least of these. Whatever it may be. Maybe right now, it's this idea of, of being a part and attending faithfully a local church. And I can just sit at home and watch. That's the same thing, right? Well, it's not. Amen. It's not the same thing. And Jesus says, whoever relaxes even the least of these. And so I'll say, I think it's different if you just can't physically get here. Amen. That's one thing. I'm glad this is available live stream. So if you can't physically get here, you can still participate to some degree. Yeah. But if you're able to be here, but you just don't want to be or you think it's better not to be for whatever reason, you're relaxing the least of these. Yeah. Right? That's what he says. And that's what people do today. But they want to deny the preeminence of God's word. That means it's the highest authority. There's nothing higher than that. But that's not the way we act at large, is it? Even the disciples told Jesus at times, when he would talk to them, they'd say, well, but the scribes say. And Jesus would basically have to be like, all right, boys, let me start over. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the scribes say. It matters what God has said. Amen. And so the same thing happens today. People want to say, well, well I, I understand that the word of God is the highest authority there is. But whatever, right? And what being the highest authority means is this. There's nothing higher than that. No other book, right? No news article, no scientific study. Uh, no politician or, or their policies. Uh, not, I don't care if somebody has a PhD. I don't care if they have a PhD in theology or Jewish history or whatever. Right? They're not an authority above the Word of God. Whatever yeah. uh, they have is beneath the Word of God. This determines if what they say is right, not the other way around. Yeah. 
And, but that's what people want to do. They say, well, this person says, or that person says, or Dr. So-and-so says, or this organization says, well, uh, okay, but what you're doing is denying the ultimate authority of God's word. Uh, and and uh, they're, they're, they're lowering it. They're relaxing. They're lowering the standard or loosening the standard. Therefore, verse 19, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be least. And so the point is this. If you relax it, if you loosen, right? If you play fast and loose, if you lessen your obligation to the scripture, uh, Jesus says you're called least in the kingdom of heaven. He didn't come to destroy it. He didn't come to do away with it. He's not overriding it. He's not changing it. He's focusing them where they should be. But when he says even the least of these, here's the point. The temptation for believers is not to just throw the whole thing out, right? If you're a believer, the temptation is not to throw the whole thing out. I had a conversation with someone this week, and their whole premise of their statements uh, back and forth was that it's I was messing up somehow, like I was in the wrong for uh, what they said that they accused me of was I don't remember the wording. Basically, that I was elevating, that's the word, I was elevating the word of God over the, the leading and guiding of the Holy Spirit to reveal things to me. Because we had a disagreement, I said, well, the Bible says this about that. And they said, oh, well, you know, you're elevating this. How do you, what, what if the Holy Spirit reveals something to you personally? I said, he does. He does it through the Bible. Amen. Right? But at the same time, that person wanted to quote other passages to me to prove their point. But the nice scripture that I was quoting to hold and support my position. And so what is that? That's their standards fluid. It's not consistent. They only want to believe the parts that are convenient for them and ignore the parts that go against what they believe. And that's what Jesus says. He doesn't say whoever throws the whole thing out. Obviously, that's a problem. He says whoever relaxes even the least of these. Because the temptation is to take the things I like and dismiss the things I don't like. The temptation is to pick and choose. The temptation is to do that kind of thing. And so he says even the least of these. And so the problem is today, some people want to go to the scripture and they want to dress some things up and they want to dress some things down and some things they just don't want to address at all. right? And so they want to, they want to take this and leave that. And they want to take the, the Word of God further than God has taken it in some areas. And they want to stop short of where God goes in other areas. And so there's no consistency there. And where there's no consistent, ultimate, unchanging authority of truth, then there cannot be a standard for righteous living. The reason that person was, is being so frustrated in our back and forth is because they don't have a leg to stand on. Because on the one hand, they're telling me I have to believe the Holy Spirit revealed these things to them personally. But on the other hand, they're telling me I should believe part of what they're saying because the scripture says it. Well, which is it? First of all, the word of God and the Holy Spirit are never going to contradict each other. Anything he would reveal to me personally, he's already revealed to me here. Amen. But they have no standard. There's no consistency. There's no law and order when there's no standard, unchanging standard for truth. And so denying authority and sufficiency of the scripture. And, and today the same thing happens, right? Even, even preachers and pulpits. Even preachers and pulpits, right? They want to do that. Rather than coming to the word of God and preaching it and letting the, letting the scripture determine what I preach, they want to say, oh, I, I want to preach about this. And then try to go find a scripture they can smash in to fit what they want to preach about, right? I want to preach about this, and now I'm going to find things I can kind of pick and throw in this box that fit what I want to talk about. But then they want to, again, like last week, when we lose saltiness, when we cover our life, we look at the world around us and say, why has this happened? And, and those same preachers who want to just do all this grabbing all over the place and throw it and mush it into something that fits their own agenda, what they want to talk about, instead of just letting the book say what the book says, they want to make it say what they want to say. And those same people will then say, well, I don't understand. Why does my congregation have no respect for the Word of God? Why does my congregation disagree with what the Bible says right here? Because what you've modeled before them is that you can just pick and choose and make stuff fit whatever you want it to fit. It's like a, a, a 10 years in youth ministry. It's like a parent 
who their teenager starts to be kind of crazy and wild. And they'd come to me and say, Brother Tyler, I don't, you know, all this is, I just don't know where we went wrong. I want to say, really? Because I only see what you post on Facebook and I have a pretty good place where to start. I don't even know what's going on in your house. But I know this, when they were six, seven, eight years old, you acted like it was cute for them to act that way. And when they're 14, all of a sudden you say it's not cute anymore. There's no consistency. You know where you went wrong? You, there wasn't a standard, consistent, authoritative, uh, moral truth. And so I don't, I don't know how many times that would happen, right? Uh, especially you'd have a parent come in, just, I'll just give a generic example that happens a lot. And their daughter's grown up now, she's a teenager, she's in college or whatever, and she's very, very promiscuous, and she's not very self-respecting, and they don't know where they went wrong. And I want to say, well, I've known you all for 10 years, and you were buying her clothes just like that when she was seven. And it was okay when she was seven. But now that she's 21, you think it's trashy. There's no standard, of, there's no consistency there. And where there's not absolute standard of authority and truth, there cannot be consistency. And the same thing happens. you got preachers that, that don't know what's going on with their people. But the way they're preaching to them is training them to just pick and choose what you like and don't like. Where they get up and they'll preach everything else, right? They'll preach about uh, sociology and psychology and biology. And they'll proclaim every ology from their pulpit except theology. And they don't know what's going on. But when we change or ignore or relax or reinterpret or dismiss, whatever, it creates major issues. And so Jesus says, I haven't come to do that. I've come to draw your focus back to the truth of God's word. And so he, he is talking about when you have a low view of God's word, when you have a misplaced view, right? There's going to be problems. You have a low view of God's word, guess what else is going to happen? You're going to have a low view of church membership. You're going to have a low view of the church in general. You have a low view of, of the way you live in your life every day. You think it doesn't really matter. You're going to have a low view of giving. You're going to have a low view of service. Because when you have an improper view, when your standard isn't placed in the right place, then everything that's supposed to come from that standard is going to be off too. And that's what Jesus said had happened. They had messed up the law based on their traditions and opinions and their own agendas. And so then he goes on to say, and I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, they're the most righteous people of the time, right? That's what they had told everybody. So if you're listening to this, and Jesus says, as righteous as the Pharisees claim to be, they're not even righteous enough. Then what are the rest of us supposed to do? If this is the standard of righteousness, and even those guys don't meet it, what are the rest of us supposed to do? And that's the point. Jesus is driving home what we'll see starting in verse 21 next week. That That's the whole point. Even the Pharisees' righteousness isn't enough. Because you don't have any righteousness of your own. Even what they think is righteousness of their own is not. And so he's pointing, he's pointing out this spiritual bankruptcy that you're not righteous, that there is a standard, an absolute standard for truth and righteousness, and you can't keep it perfectly. Even the guys who try the hardest, right, the Pharisees, have missed the whole point. And so not just that you have to be as righteous as them, they don't make the cut either. He says unless it exceeds their righteousness. And so Jesus comes in then and starts to say, you've heard it said, but I say to you, and the whole point of this, and I'll wrap up with this kind of is, that, that yes, there's a standard. We have to obey that and follow that. And, and Jesus says the problem is you can't do it perfectly, right? It's not this point. It's not this question of throwing the whole thing out. It's this question of relaxing or playing fast and loose with even the least of these things. And if we're all honest, self-included, right? I've done that. I've done that. And you've done that. And the guys that were trying the hardest, right, the Pharisees, had done that. And if they aren't righteous and they can't keep it, what hope is there for us? But the good news is this. What's Jesus say? He came to fulfill it. Yeah. I can't keep it. They couldn't keep it. You can't keep it. But he can. Yeah. And he did. Yeah. And so now he's, he's going to draw out and point out spiritual bankruptcy in people as we'll see moving forward. He starts to say things like, oh, well, you've never committed murder. Okay. Have you ever had hatred and anger for somebody in your heart? 
Not just the outside, but the inside. It should be easy to not murder people, right? But what about your heart? He says, oh, you've never committed adultery. Okay, it should be easy to not just go sleep around with people you're not married, married to. But Jesus says, what about your heart? You think you're good at loving people? think you're a loving, loving person? Well, it's easy to love people that love you, but Jesus says, I say to you, love your enemies. And so he starts to point out, listen, there's a standard that God has revealed, and we're called to keep it. We have a responsibility to keep it. We are going to answer for the parts we relax. However, thank goodness our getting to the kingdom is not based on how closely I keep it. But if I trust in the one who has kept it perfectly. And so this morning, I just want to say as we get ready for invitation is in a world today that's not any really different than what Jesus is talking about, where where there are those who want to change the law and relax the law and, and, and they say that Jesus would be doing something different today, or, or they want to preach everything but theology, or they want to talk about all these other things except for the standard of righteousness. Uh, the, the reality is this, if you're a believer, you're not going to keep it perfectly, you're going to mess up. But how do you know when you messed up? Because the Bible lets you know. Right? It's the Word of God that lets me know when I've fallen short. And it's the Word of God that chisels away at me and rebuilds me and starts to make me and it continues making me more and more like Christ. That sanctification that we've talked about. And so I'm still, just because I can't do it, doesn't mean I should throw my hands up and say, well, I can't do this anyway, right? What did Paul say in Romans? Should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? By no means, right? But if you're here this morning and you're not a believer, and you say, well, I can't keep it, so, well, I don't have any hope. Or you say, you know what? I have been doing some of those things, and maybe this morning's the first time listening at home or sitting here that you've realized that you're lost, that you have no righteousness of your own, because your righteousness doesn't exceed that of the Pharisees, and if those guys can't get into the kingdom of heaven based on their righteousness, then there's no hope for you. And I want you to know that that's a good place to be. Because there are people who hear preaching week after week, and they never get to that place. But if you've gotten to that place where you realize I've been trusting in all this other stuff, and I really can't get there on my own, but he can, and he's done it for me, you can place your trust and faith in him, right? Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Amen. And if you've never done that, I would encourage you to talk to somebody about that this morning. Or if you have done that, you just hadn't told anybody yet, right? Jesus said in John 3, if you believe in him, that you're not condemned anymore. If you've placed your faith and, Christ, and trust in Christ alone, and you just need to tell people about that, you can do that this morning too. Amen. But for the believer, are you relaxing the least of these? We all do it from time to time. But maybe this morning uh, you've been relaxing the, the command to follow Christ in baptism. Kind of dismissing that one. It's not a big deal. It's just a little thing. Maybe you've been dismissing the call to uh, join and be a committed part of a local church. Well, you know, church membership, that's not a huge, it's just a little thing. Maybe, maybe you've been dismissing the call to be serious about your membership. You're already a member, but you need to get serious about your membership. Well, it's okay if I miss here or there. Or, you know, I don't have to help with everything. I can just show up and I can just be a consumer, not a contributor. It's just a little thing. Jesus said, whoever relaxes the least of these things. And I'm guilty of it too, but I'd encourage you this morning, whatever business you need to take care of with God, whatever he's calling you to, to follow deeper, more closely, that you take care of that. Because it's a serious thing. And the standard hasn't changed. Even though it's 2022, same standard. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you again for who you are and all you do for us. But we just pray that you would give clarity where needed and conviction where needed and courage where needed this morning. God, that we would understand that uh, whatever the rest of the world is doing, whatever other uh, so-called churches and, and self-claiming believers are doing, Lord, that we understand that your word is the standard, that you have set that standard and we don't get to change it. God, that we would strive to follow that more closely every day. Allow your word and your Holy Spirit to shape us and mold us and break us and rebuild us more to the image of your son. And God, I just pray that we would 
not be able to just brush off when we relax the least of these and play fast and loose with the scripture but that we would experience conviction and then guidance and direction on how to correct our behaviors and our thoughts and our minds that we would not be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind through your word and the teaching and comforting and leadership of your spirit we pray for those that don't know you that they come to know you before it's too late that they would have conviction that they can't shake and we pray these things in the name of your son amen amen